So the first significance of altars is that it was sanctified and anointed by God. It was then purified and made holy before God. It means that it was a place of purging and purification for those that engaged it, chiefly the Israelites. In Exodus 29, verse 36 to 37, the Bible says, And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering, for atonement, and thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. Seven days thou shalt make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it, and it shall be an altar most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall be holy. In Exodus 29 verse 44, the Bible says, And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. I will sanctify also both Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. This means that if we can engage our altars where we go up daily even to pray and make intercessions and supplications, we too can be purged and purified. Do you notice that the Bible says that whatever touches even the altar will be, will be made holy? It means that if we can make a habit of engaging daily our altars in prayers, then we are on our way to possessing all things even in God because we will be as God wanting nothing upon the surface of the earth. If only we can come to this understanding, then our struggles will be reduced, if not totally eradicated. Hallelujah. So the second significance of altars is that altars acted as protection even for the people who engaged it. King David became very old and his son Adonijah was about to make himself king since he was the second born after Absalom. He took some people and was about to crown himself king. But God intervened and King David crowned King Solomon as king over Israel instead. Adonijah, on hearing that Solomon was crowned king, feared that King Solomon even would kill him for attempting to crown himself as king. Thus, he went to the temple and cut, and cut a hold on the horns of the altar. And when it was told King Solomon, he sent and told Adonijah that he would not be killed except treachery was found in him. So as I told you before, one of the characteristic features of altars is that it has horns on the four edges. And I told you that horns there symbolizes the their power and ability of God to save and deliver. So when you see men hold onto the horns of the altar, they were saying, I trust you, O God. I trust you, O God, to be able to deliver me in this situation. And that was what this man did, Adonijah. And we saw that King Solomon helped him and told him that he would not be killed. Hallelujah. However, this protection that we are talking about was not for a murderer. In Exodus 21 verse 14, the Bible says, But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with God, he said, Thou shalt take him from mine altar, and he may die. And this is why King Solomon had to finally kill Adonijah. Because evil was found in him. He couldn't rest secured, but kept plotting evil on how he will overthrow King Solomon and become king. And this was why he requested that Abishai even be giving him to wife in keeping with his plot. Adonijah could kill King Solomon even to become king if he had the opportunity. Jesus told us that once an evil deed is conceived in the heart, he said that deed is already committed. And that was why the wisest man that ever lived, King Solomon, probably had to kill Adonijah. In Matthew 5, verse 28, he said, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. This is very previous. It was as if Jesus was telling us how God sees sin. And this was how Satan was judged. Satan didn't actually overthrow God, but because he said it in his heart, he was judged. And this is why the Bible admonishes us even to guard our heart with all diligence because say, out of it are the issues of life. You also saw that it was a direct command given to you. It says, guard your heart. Thus, the responsibility of guarding your heart 
even from going astray, is given to you. You are not a robot. Thus, you must learn to use your we and say no even to the devil and say yes even to God. Hallelujah. The third significance of altars is that it was a symbol of God's all-consuming presence. This was why fire was to continuously burn on the altar. In Leviticus chapter 6, verse 13, the Bible says, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. We know how fire can be tormenting to the flesh. It is one thing witches and wizards fear so much. And that is why their final destruction will be in the lake of fire called hair fire. Fire actually gives warmth, physically speaking. It also gives protection from predators and other disturbing insects and flies. And that is why it is said that flies doesn't perch on hot food. Why light attracts insects and flies, fire torments them. And this is why in some of these ancient films, they usually burn fires whenever they wanted to sleep in the forest. This was to keep wild animals away from them. Fire also speaks of fervency. It is called keeping the spirit aglow. Thus, keep your spirit aglow at all times. And you do this by praying all manner of prayers, especially speaking in tongues. Amen. So the fourth significance of altars is that altars were also used for idolatrous worship. They were sometimes erected or built on roofs of houses. In 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 12, the Bible says, And the altar that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook kindred. These kinds of altars built by idolaters usually had grooves planted even near them. A groove is a small forest or an orchard of trees. It is a place of worship. In Judges chapter 6 verse 30, the Bible says, Then the men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he had cast down the altar of Baal, and because he had cast down the groove that was by it. So you see that there was a groove that was near it. So most of these altars had groove by it. And this was why the Jews were instructed never even to plant grooves or plantation near their altars since it symbolized idolatrous worship. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 21, we say, Thou shalt not plant thee a groove of any tree near unto the altars of the Lord thy God, which thou shalt make thee. So this was a warning. And this invention of planting you know, grooves around or near altars, it started with the Druids. These, you know, were an order of priests before the adoption of Abrahamic religions. That is those that call upon the true God who is the I am. Also, this is why altars were sometimes renewed, reconsecrated, cleansed or repaired even to make it fit as an altar, even unto holy use, as I said before. In 2 Corinthians chapter 29, verse 16, the Bible says, And the priest went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it and brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord unto the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it even to carry it out abroad into the brook Kindron. So this was King Hezekiah trying to make the temple of God a faithful habitation even for God. And that is why he asked that every defilement be taken out of the sanctuary. In 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 16, the Bible says, And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. So this was the story of King Manasseh who ruled longest in Jerusalem. He ruled for 55 years, thereabout, but invented all forms of evil instead of good. He rebelled against God and went the way of the kings of the earth. Thus, God caused him even to be captured by the captain 
of the host of the kings of Assyria, who took him even from where he was hiding among the thorns, and bound him even with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. But the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 12 to 13, that when he was in his affliction, he said, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him. And he was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again even to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. It was after this experience that he now repaired the altar of the Lord and for the first time sacrificed peace offering and tank offering and commanded Judah also to serve the Lord God of Israel. The question is, why wait until you are afflicted before you do the right thing? That is the question. Please make hay while the sun shines.